astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins flew back from a weekend with their families to the Kennedy Space Center today and started their final training there for the flight of Apollo 11. We have a report from Walter Cronkite. I had 39A, Kennedy Space Center, July 7th, 1969. The year, the month, almost the moment now, when man becomes a creature of two worlds. Apollo 11 will leave for a landing on the moon just nine days from now, if, in that oldest cliche of the space program, if all goes well. Small problems have cropped up. Technicians replaced a balky inertial measuring unit, the device that tells Apollo where it is and where it's going. The new unit appears to be working perfectly. And President Nixon today bowed to the wishes of Dr. Charles Berry and canceled a pre-launch dinner with the astronauts. It seems that even presidents have germs and they don't want to take any chances with the Apollo 11 crew. Mr. Nixon won't see them in the flesh until after splashdown. This return to the Kennedy Space Center is a sort of mini splashdown for me. I've spent the past week traveling to the Apollo installations that hang like a national wash on a line from Long Island to California. The idea was to get the feeling of the space program and its hundreds of thousands of people on the eve of their greatest triumph and their greatest uncertainty. We begin tonight in Arizona. Here in a volcanic waste called Cinder Lake outside Flagstaff, Arizona, geologists have blasted out a crater field that duplicates yard by yard a portion of moon landing site two where Apollo 11 is scheduled to touch down on July 20th. That orange tape marks the probable limit of the astronauts' walk on the moon, a radius of 100 feet from the limb, and they may not even get that far. Armstrong and Aldrin will spend less than three hours on the moon, perhaps as little as 20 minutes actually looking for rock samples to bring home. It's a remarkably small piece of moon to climax nine years and $24 billion. Here in this duplicate moon field where the astronauts themselves have trained in the rudiments of geology, Gordon Swan of the United States Center for Astrogeology talked about how the men of Apollo 11 will prospect the moon and how much and how little they can add to man's knowledge. Uh, Gordon, the uh, geological part of the experiment landing on the moon really begins before they ever come down from the uh, lunar module itself. That's correct. Uh, this will give us our first a close man's eye view of the moon's surface, and they'll get it from looking out of the limb windows. They'll be about 15 feet above the surface, which is a pretty good vantage point from which to look at the details of the surface. And they'll spend uh, probably a number of minutes describing that surface from the windows, and they'll take a few photographs out of the windows. This will occur maybe several hours before they actually get out on the surface. Well, now, after they've given you that first information from what they see out the window, uh, they come down the magic steps to the moon. Then what happens in the geological experiment? Well, they have what's called a contingency sampler, and we don't have one here, but it looks very similar to this gadget. In the spacesuit, they won't be able to bend over very far, so all their tools have to have long handles. And this contingency sampler is a gadget that looks very much like this. And he will simply assemble that, reach down, scoop it full of lunar material, take the head off. It's actually a little plastic bag. He rolls the thing up and sticks it in his pocket. And this uh, pretty much assures us that we're going to get at least one piece or one scoop full of lunar material back, because it's going to be right in his pocket. But the next thing in the geologic experiment, and this is the part that's most interesting to us, is what is called the documented sample. And we hope very much that he will have time to collect this sample. The first sample in the documented sample is one to be taken with a drive tube or a core tube. This is a hollow tube with a bit on the end. And he will attach this extension handle to the core tube take his hammer, none of these tools will be on the ground. They will be on a thing called a mesa that folds down from the side of the limb. Kind of, kind of a work tray. Kind, of, kind of a work table. Yeah. And he'll insert it in the ground, drive the core tube in. We think it'll work pretty well in lunar material. This material is pretty coarse for this little tube. But he drives it in with this hammer. After he gets it in, removes it, disconnects it, unscrews this, puts a cap on. And this will give us a core about 16 inches long, 
that goes straight down into the surface and should preserve the microstratigraphy that might be present. Hopefully they will be land close to some feature that's as interesting as this particular crater right here. This is a rather blocky crater, blocks that have been ejected out of the crater, and we've seen this same sort of thing on the lunar orbiter and surveyor photographs. Uh, there are quite a few of these kinds of craters on the moon. Hopefully they'll land near something like this and be able to walk over to it and rather systematically and selectively sample uh, materials from around the crater. Are they going to be able to walk up and look down into a crater like this? I don't think they're going to want to walk this close to the edge of a crater this large. If the, there's no real reason why he would fall in it, but if something should happen that he did fall and fell into the crater, it might be rather difficult to get out. So at least in the first few missions, I think he's going to stay a few feet away from the crater. And from all of this, uh, eventually, when we get enough of these samples and have done enough exploration of the moon, we will know fairly specifically how the moon was formed. We'll know then we can relate that back to Earth as to how the Earth was formed. And perhaps we'll learn something about our own resources that would enable us in future years to better utilize our own natural resources on this Earth. I think that's correct. Uh, by comparison, we'll be able to say the moon was formed this way and the Earth this way. We can compare the things, and I think we'll get a lot of information that in the future will apply directly to our uh, resources. Apollo 11's walk on the moon. Even though Earth is a far more various planet than the moon, Perhaps the best way to appraise the value and limitations of Apollo 11 is this. Suppose we had never known Earth except through telescopes. And suppose after enormous effort, we had at last landed for the very first time here in this cinder bed in northern Arizona. Our samples from here certainly would not tell us all or even a great deal about Earth, but they would extend enormously our knowledge of the once distant planet. Border Crime Guide, CBS News, near Flagstaff, Arizona.